Welcome to Church at Home. This is Pastor Chris. I'm here at Glory Baptist Church. I'm so glad that you've chosen to spend a little bit of time with us here on Easter morning. We have a couple of quick announcements. We're going to say a few prayers, and then we're going to get started with our sermon. If you didn't have a chance, uh, look down below. You'll see some songs that were suggested by Tanya Peets that you can click on. That'll take you to YouTube. That are some worship songs to, to help you get in the spirit. I would wait until after you watch the sermon now at this point, but then afterwards... Pick out a few of those songs, give them a rip, get some singing in, make a joyful noise. The great thing about singing at home is you can sing as loud as you want and nobody knows. The dog might start singing along with you, but that's okay. He needs Jesus too, so don't have a problem with that. But make a joyful noise, have some fun. It is Easter and we want to celebrate. As I said, we do have announcements. Trish, our church superstar admin office rock star, puts together a bulletin every week whether or not we are here in person so that you can have all the information that you might need. I printed this one out. If you go to our church's website, akinchurch.com, and then under media, it'll say sermons and church bulletins. Click on the bulletins there, and you'll see the last uh, handful of weeks, and you could print any of those out. You could look at them on your phone while you watch uh, uh, television or whatever it might be. So they're there for your blessing and for your use. Um, just a couple of things that we do want to highlight and spotlight. If you haven't signed up for electronic giving, we would encourage you to do that. Uh, very, very simple process. It's a safe, secure process. If you have any questions about how to do that, uh, both David Baker as well as Ruth Eggstead have volunteered to walk you through it step by step and do whatever it needs to help you get that set up. Um, it's a, a fantastic system. It's a system that uh, we used in my previous church, so I have going on a, a better part of a decade of experience with this company. Never had a single problem with them. Never had any security issues with them. They are fabulous. It's actually a Minnesota-based company, and uh, they do great work. And so um, electronic giving is, is a great way to go in this time because, again, we can't come physically together. So you can give online. You can give to benevolence that way. You can give to missions that way. You, you can give your regular tithes and offerings to the general uh, church budget that way. Um, we are thankful that we are blessed and, and you have been incredibly generous to us in, in the year leading up to this. And so uh, this isn't a, a begging for money kind of situation. That's not what I'm doing. But if you would be willing and would like to give, we appreciate your support. And it is useful to do the work of God, to continue the work of Glory Baptist Church, and to keep things moving forward. And so, again, if you are willing, sign up online. Uh, if you just want to make a one-time gift, you can do that as well. The easy way to find it, if you go to aitkinchurch.com, A-I-T-K-I-N, church.com, and then in the top right-hand corner, there's a little thing that says give. Now, if you're doing it on your phone, there'll be a little little lines, and just click on that, and it opens up a drop-down box, and then select Give. On that page, it talks about why we give, and also will show you the way uh, in which to sign up for the electronic giving. There's a guide on there that you can download if you need help for how to sign up for the online giving. It's a very simple, very easy process. So, uh, again, thank you for your incredible generosity. God is doing great things through Gloria Baptist Church, and I am so blessed to be your pastor. Uh, we, are, we are truly thankful for each and every one of you. And so, happy Easter, and thanks for stopping in. The other things we do want to point out, uh, lots of things to be in prayer for. We continue to pray, of course, for our world, for all the things that are going on right now with social distancing, with COVID-19, people getting sick and just praying for the protection of, of our church people, but of the people in the world as well. Praying for nurses and doctors and, and admin staff that, that admit people into the hospital and all the janitors and EMTs and first responders and police and people who serve at the gas station and, and people who serve at the grocery store because they're enabling us to, to be home. Uh, people who work on electrical lines. We had power outages just a couple weekends ago. And, and people like that, that that do services behind the scenes that allow us to to be healthy and to be safe. And so praising God for each and every one of them. If that's you, thank you for your service to us. We, we do appreciate that and we are praying for you on a daily basis. We're praying for our church as well. People in our church with health concerns, there's quite a number of those um, ongoing end-of-life issues in a couple of families. We had the passing of Sonny Flowers recently and his funeral last weekend, and so keep the Flowers family in, in your prayers. Uh, prayers for healing, certainly for those who are recovering from heart surgeries and cancers and all kinds of other things. 
and uh, certainly lift all of those up in prayer. You'll find on our bulletin there's a, a weekly call to prayer in there. We're praying for a couple of families that are expecting children. Um, our family of the week is John and Connie Pearson. Uh, praying for them. We love John and Connie. They are awesome. Such a, a wonderful couple and uh, uh, truly just they, they literally bring a smile to my face just saying their names and so uh, blessed to have people like that in my church. Uh, praying for our missionaries all over the globe. Um, praying for the, the ministries that we support. Praying for lots and lots and lots of different things. Praying for people's relationships. Praying for people's finances in this time of economic uncertainty for so many. We have a number of people in our church that have lost jobs or had their jobs cut severely back or their income reduced because of the line of work that they're in. Um, we're certainly praying for you. And if we can love you, serve you, bless you in some sort of way, let us know if we can be of assistance. I can't guarantee we can pay all of your bills, but if we can come alongside of you and help you in, in for a little while, um, that's what we're here for. That's what the church is here for. And, and we want to be a giving church, a generous church, a church that blesses others, a church that, that truly walks the walk and not just talks the talk. And so if you find yourself in a bind, let us know, and we want to be able to help you. We want to bless you. Our deacons have a benevolence fund um, that we use for those sorts of things, and if we have to go beyond that, uh, we will talk about that and, and find a way to, to, to love and serve you. That's what we want to be about. And so pray for our soldiers, men and women all over the globe and in America, Army, Navy, Air Force, Marines, Coast Guard, Merchant Marines, and all the others that serve on the borders and all sorts of other places. Keep all of those men and women in your prayers as well. Uh, we are so thankful to live in America where we can worship, celebrate, praise the Lord, make much of Jesus very publicly without fear, without worry. Um, that is a, a truly wonderful thing that we need to be thankful for and remind ourselves to continue to pray for those in places where they don't have that freedom, where the church is being persecuted. Uh, on top of already the, the, the struggle we're all going through with COVID-19 and, and social distancing, there's places where where people haven't been able to gather for a long time because they're Christians. Can you imagine that? And so keep our brothers and sisters in prayer for that as well. Um, continue just to pray for the church, pray for Pastor Kevin, pray, pray for myself, pray that we can continue to make connections and love and serve, and uh, pray for ways that you might reach out to your neighbor and love them and serve them. That would be awesome too. So with that, let's say a quick prayer, and then we will jump in to reading the Bible passage, and then into the message. Let's pray. God, we thank you that you are our God. We rejoice in this Easter season for your love for your son Jesus, whom you sent for us. And God, we are humbled and amazed that you would choose to be in relationship with us. That is a beautiful thing. And on this day, Lord, we lift up to you the many who are hurting and suffering, uh, who are struggling. Lord, there's much in the world that is not the way that you would want it to be. It, it is broken by sin. And that is not the way you designed it or wanted it to be. It's the result of our sin, Lord, that the world is broken. But God, you tell us that despite that, you work in it and you hear our prayers. And so we lift up to you our prayers and concerns. We lift up to you our hearts wondering, Lord, will you move in amazing and mighty ways so that we might give you all the glory. God, we pray for those who are suffering physically, mentally, emotionally, spiritually, financially. God, just comfort them. Bring your mercy to them. And Lord, where we as your people can come alongside of them and love them and serve them, show us the way, and may we do so in the love of Jesus. God, as we continue in worship, just show your presence. Continue to grow us personally and continue to grow your church. We are amazed by your love, and we are thankful in that. Thank you for your love and blessing. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. One other quick announcement. Today at 3 o'clock, we are going to do a parade of prayer. Now, if you haven't heard of that, you don't know what that's about, let me quickly explain. We're going to meet at the parking lot of Shopco in Aiken at 3 o'clock this afternoon. We ask that you stay in your cars, keep a distance between one another. We're trying to abide by all the Minnesota Department of Health rules and regulations with that. But what we're going to do is we're going to gather together, and at about 3.05, uh, we'll proceed to some sites across the city of Aiken where we're going to pray for those who live and work at those places. We're going to go to um, Aiken Health Services. We're going to go to Rippleside Elementary. 
Uh, Aiken Health Services includes Black Rock as well. Uh, eight, Rippleside Elementary, and then we're gonna go to River's Edge, which is right behind Holiday there, and that's a senior living facility. We're gonna go to the city offices where the police and fire department are. We're going to go to the county offices where the sheriffs and all the other people are there. We're gonna go to the high school. We're gonna go to Acota. We're gonna go to Golden Horizons. And we're going to go to Riverwood Hospital. Now we don't wanna approach the buildings. We don't wanna get in the way of any of their operations. We don't wanna cause any problems. We're gonna stay back at a distance and gather uh, as a group of cars. And then we'll have a prayer leader to pray at those sites to help lead in prayer. And invite you to join us for that. We're just gonna drive around, we're gonna enjoy the day, we're gonna pray, and then we're gonna go home. And uh, we've already decorated my minivan. If you wanna decorate your vehicle, that would be awesome. We've got uh, Easter paint all over our minivan. My wife has done a wonderful job with that. She is an art teacher, so I kinda have an advantage. But feel free, do some decorations, have some fun with it, and come on out and pray with us. Uh, shouldn't take too terribly long. I'm thinking a half hour or 45 minutes, uh, maybe up to an hour at the very most, depending on how many cars come. If we have a very small group, um, we'll just all go place to place to place. If we have enough people, I'd like to divide into two or three different groups uh, so that each group will go to either three, if there's three groups, or four and five places if there's only two groups, because there's a total of nine locations. And so I would love to have you join us again, three o'clock today, at Shop Ghost parking lot in Aiken, and we will leave at about 3.05. So if you miss us, join us then at uh, Aiken Health Services or Rippleside Elementary. Those will be probably the two first stops as we go. So join us today for a parade of prayer. Hope to see you soon. God bless. I'm Pastor Chris Myros, and we are celebrating the risen Lord Jesus Christ. Whether or not we are gathered together in one person, we are still the church, and we are rejoicing. I'm glad you stopped in. I'm glad you've given us a little bit of your time. I hope that this is a blessing to you today. If you've got a Bible, grab that. We're going to be in the book of John. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are the first four books of the New Testament. We're going to be in the book of John, John chapter 30. Uh, before I read it, I wanted to give you some sense of what the story is. Um, the Christian message centers on the fact of the bodily resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. It's not a metaphor or a symbol for some abstract spiritual experience. It's not a myth concocted by the religiously deranged or uh, a deception deployed by the strong to manipulate the weak. It, it's a fact of history. It is the fact of history, in fact. The power of the world to come has broken in right in the middle of the world that is the now is. Death has been made to work in reverse. Life has overcome it in the triumphant resurrection of Jesus Christ from the grave. The resurrection of Jesus is a reality. He lives. He was raised with the same body that he had suffered and bled and died. And today he lives sitting at the right hand of God as truly as you are sitting there watching this right now in this very moment. He fills a definite space and a definite place in a glorified human body. That's the Christian claim anyhow, and, and that's important to understand because as we read this passage before us, focusing on Mary's encounter with the risen Jesus, we need to understand what's really going on. The, this passage is making a claim. Indeed, it's making an offer to you. Because Jesus is alive, the Christian gospel is a, a means by which you can meet him yourself just as Mary met him in the garden tomb that very first Easter Sunday. And so with that, let's jump in John chapter 20. As I said, if you've got a Bible, feel free to open that up. Uh, you're online, you're watching, you can open version. If you're watching on your TV or your computer, grab out your phone and, and feel free to follow along. I'm going to read John 20 um, verses 1 through 18. There it says, Now on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb early, while it was still dark, and saw that the stone had been taken away from the tomb. So she ran, to, she ran and went to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved, and said to them, They have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they have laid him. So Peter went out with the other disciple, 
and they were going towards the tomb. Both of them were running together, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. And stooping to look in, he saw the linen cloths lying there, but did not go in. Then Simon Peter came, following him, and went into the tomb. He saw the linen cloths lying there, and the face cloth which had been on Jesus' head, not lying with the linen cloths, but folded up in a place by itself. Then the other disciple, who had reached the tomb first, also went in, and he saw and believed. For as yet they did not understand the scripture that he must rise from the dead. Then the disciples went back to their homes. Verse 11. But Mary stood weeping outside of the tomb. And as she wept, she stooped and she looked into the tomb. And she saw two angels in white sitting where the body of Jesus had lain, one at the head and one at the feet. They said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? She said to them, They have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. Having said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing, but she did not know it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? Supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him, and I will take him away. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned and said to him in Aramaic, Rabboni, which means teacher. Jesus said to her, Do not cling to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father. And Jesus said to her, Do not cling to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father. But go to my brothers and say to them, I am ascending to my Father, and your Father Jesus said to her, Do not cling to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father. But go to my brothers and say to them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went and announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord, and that he had said these things to her. J.R.R. Tolkien, the author of The Hobbit and The Lord of the Rings, coined a phrase that describes for him a crucial element in good storytelling. He coined the word eucatastrophe, and he explicitly relates it to the resurrection. The resurrection, he said, is the archetypal eucatastrophe. We know what a catastrophe is, of course. A catastrophe is a disaster that suddenly overtakes us that could not be prevented. A eucatastrophe is a good catastrophe. A disaster is about to descend suddenly. There is a, a glorious uh, uh, reversal, and, and a good rather than evil is what ensues. And the resurrection, of course, is the great you catastrophe. Mary is about to encounter it in a dramatic way in her life and experience. She is overcome with grief, and eventually her eyes are open to see the risen Lord standing there before her. The passage does focus on verses 11 through 18, where Jesus meets with Mary, and he says three things to her. He speaks a word of correction to her in verse 15, a word of calling in verse 16, and then a word of commission in verses 17 and 18. And we're going to focus on that in a few moments. But before we do that, we need to spend some time with Mary and see her confusion. We need to see that first of all. So confusion, correction, calling, and commission. Mary's confusion. The chapter opens on the first day of the week very early on Sunday morning. It's still dark. John says that Mary Magdalene came to Jesus' tomb. The other gospel accounts, you'll see that they, they, they speak about a whole company of women who were followers of Jesus who also came along with Mary. But John wants to focus on Mary Magdalene, so he doesn't mention the other women. He does give us a clue that they were there with her also, though. In verse 2, if you will look there for a moment, we are told that when she found the stone had been rolled away, she ran to Simon Peter and the other disciple whom Jesus loved, and that, of course, is a reference to John, the author of this gospel that we are reading. And she says to the disciples, they have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they have laid him. So she's there kind of as a, 
a, a spokesperson perhaps for the group. The group have discovered that the tomb is empty and we don't know where he, they've laid him. The other gospels tell us what happened. While Mary was with the disciples reporting this to them, the other women saw angels at the tomb who explained that, that Jesus had been raised and then those women returned to the other disciples and, and then eventually explained to them what the angels had said. And, and the disciples there, they, they just basically dismissed their message out of hand. Meanwhile, though, Simon Peter and John, they, they go racing to the tomb to see what's happened here. Mary, of course, comes following along behind them. And when they get there, Simon Peter and John, they, they, they look in and they see the, the grave clothes have been folded. The face cloth is, is lying in a place by itself. And we're told they saw and they believed. That is, they believed the report that the body was missing because John says they did not yet understand the scripture that he must raise from the dead. So at this point, they leave, no doubt dismayed, confused, heartbroken over all this that's going on, that the Lord's body is now missing on top of it. And we see then that, that Mary is left there behind. We're told in verse 11 that she's outside the tomb weeping. And over and over again, actually, this passage emphasizes her distraught condition. She's weeping. She's grieving. She's heartbroken. She's devastated. Her, her, her tears give evidence, don't they, of her profound love for the Lord Jesus. In fact, her grief is so profound in, in verse 12 when there are two angels who appear to her it, it barely seems to register at all look at verse 12 she saw two angels in white sitting where the body of Jesus had lain one at the head and one at the feet now notice in this there are several interesting things about this scene for example, this is the only place in the whole of the Bible where angels are ever seen sitting down. And one was at the head and one was at the feet of where Jesus' body was. This emphasizes the emptiness of the tomb. He's not here. Another thing here with the position of the angels is that they were positioned like the golden cherubim those angelic statues who were positioned at each end of the mercy seat uh, on the Ark of the Covenant. And, and, and that was the, the place where the high priest would, in the Old Testament, sprinkle the blood on the Day of Atonement to make payment for the sin of the people. Is John here maybe alluding to that and, and, and suggesting to us a, a picture of that, a, a fulfillment of that, the atonement made in the blood of Jesus and accepted before God? I think he might be. But whatever the symbolism and significance of the visitation of these angels, Mary misses it. She doesn't seem to notice. It's almost as if she's had a conversation with angels every morning over breakfast, right? I mean, she's just very casual. None of it penetrates. Instead, when the, the angels inquire, why are you weeping? They're astonished, right? Why would you be weeping, Mary? He's alive, don't you see? And she replies through her tears, rather matter-of-factly, almost absent-mindedly, oh, oh, they've, they've taken the Lord away, and I don't know where they've laid him. They've taken my Lord away. You notice that that little note of intimacy in her language. When she was the, the spokeswoman for the group of women, she goes to the disciples and, they, and she says, they have taken away the Lord. We do not know where they have laid him. But now that she's alone in the tomb with her grief, she says, they've taken away my Lord. He's mine. And he's gone. And I don't know where he is. And it's just at that moment of vulnerability, in that moment of intimacy, that Mary becomes aware of someone standing 
behind her, right? In verse 14, she turns around. Lo and behold, there's Jesus standing there, alive from the grave. And still, she doesn't know it was Jesus. Some have suggested that this is another indicator of just how profound her grief was. Her tears were blinding her. Her grief is blinding her from seeing Jesus. But I think there's more to it than just that. Because there are other instances of encounters with the disciples, for instance, after the resurrection, that play out just like this one. For example, the disciples on the road to Emmaus in Luke 24. They knew about the cross, but they did not yet know about the resurrection. And when Jesus met them, like Mary, they too were blind, and Jesus has to open their eyes supernaturally as he's about to do supernaturally for Mary. The blindness here isn't simply psychological or emotional or physical. It's profoundly spiritual. And so even when Jesus, the living Christ, speaks to her and repeats this angelic question, Woman, why are you weeping? Whom do you seek? She doesn't recognize him. And she actually concludes that he must be the gardener. It, it's comic, in fact. For Mary, this is a moment of agony and grief. But we know how the story ends. You see, John here, as he writes this gospel, he wants us to feel some of the joy in it. Mary's tears are about to be replaced with a celebration, and John is cluing us into the sheer wonder and the absolute hilarity of this, the hilarity of the resurrection, the joy of it, the, the celebration of it. If you think about it, it's preposterous. Here is the Lord alive from the grave, and she thinks he's come down maybe to clip the roses. Clearly, she loves him. And, and who would be failed to be moved by her expression of, of intimate, tender loss and grief for her Lord? But her love is not enough. She loves him, but she does not yet understand. She doesn't remember his promises. He'd often told them that the Son of Man must suffer and be crucified and be buried and then he will rise again on the third day from the dead. And like the other disciples, just like Simon and John, she also did not yet understand the scriptures, that he must also rise from the dead. She loves him. There's care for Jesus, but there is not yet faith in his promises. The tomb was empty. There ought to have been rejoicing. Our Savior is keeping his promises. But instead, she has discounted all that Jesus has said, telling her that he would rise, and all that she can see is her grief. There is an important lesson in there, I think, for many of us that we shouldn't miss before we come to Jesus' answer to Mary. Mary loves him. She cares deeply about him. But she doesn't yet believe in his promises. Love for Christ and affection for Christian things is not enough. Love for Christ or an affection for Christian things, uh, unmixed with faith, faith in Christ himself, in Christ his person, and, and faith in his promises leaves us still blind. Only faith opens our eyes to see the risen Christ. Now, I'm assuming that you're watching this today, that you are here because you have, at some level, some affinity for Christian things. I mean, why else would you be watching this on Easter morning? But affinity for Christian things and simple love for Christ isn't enough. You must believe on the Lord 
Jesus. And I don't mean some vague, ill-defined sense of assenting to the idea about Jesus. I mean you must come personally to rely on, to trust in the Lord Jesus Christ for yourself personally. Just because you, you, you grew up in the church doesn't mean you have this. Just because you were baptized or just because you were confirmed or, or just because you're part of some Bible study, it doesn't mean you have this. Only Jesus, he and he alone can rescue you from a spiritual blindness that each and every one of us labors under by nature. Jesus, faith alone in Jesus, opens our eyes. And so that's the first thing that I want us to notice. Mary's confusion. She had so much time with Christ. She's so familiar with Christ and his message. Yet, at this crucial moment, she does not see because she does not yet believe. Now let's look at how Jesus responds started with Mary's confusion, and then Jesus speaks these three words. The first of them in verse 15 is a word of correction. You see it there in verse 15? It's a gentle word. It's a tender, kind-to-be-sure kind of word, but it's a word of correction nonetheless. Look at verse 15. Woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? What's the place of the tears here, Mary? If it's me you're looking for, why in the world would you look in this old tomb as though I would linger there for a second longer than necessary? No, Mary. The work is done. Death is dead. I have risen. Why are you weeping now, Mary? It's a word of correction. And it's a correction, to be frank, that I'll confess that I need to hear too at times. Perhaps maybe you need to hear it as well. You see, I want to be a positive person. I want to be a joy-filled encourager. But most days, I'm more of a, a glass-half-empty kind of guy. It's, it's so easy for me to see the, the negative of things, right? to find the flaw, to know just exactly how something might not work. And so I need to be reminded from time to time that Jesus is alive, that the stone has been rolled away, that the tomb is empty, that the throne is occupied, that the Lord of life has shattered the bonds of death and stepped alive again from the tomb to never die. And so while from time to time there may yet still be cause for weeping in this world, there are grounds for hope now. There are grounds for joy now because of Easter that, that no earthly sorrow could ever possibly extinguish. Jesus lives. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. 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 So maybe you're like me and you just need to lift up your head. The Bible tells us that, that weeping may last for a night, but that joy comes in the morning. With the dawn of that first Lord's Day, that Easter Sunday morning, the promise that one day death will be undone and sorrow and sadness will be no more and that the Lamb will wipe away every tear from our eyes. That promise was guaranteed in the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the grave. And so... We have here a word of correction, of loving correction, that Mary needed to hear, and that maybe you, and certainly I, need to hear. Lift up your head. Christ has risen. Weep no more. Rejoice. And then look at verse 16. The second word of the, the risen Christ in response to Mary's confusion. The first is this word of correction. The second is a word of calling. Do you see it there in verse 16? Mary thinks that he's the gardener. And so she explains her fears that, that someone has moved Jesus' body. 
Perhaps it was you, she says. If you would just tell me where you put him, I'll go get him and I'll get out of your hair and I won't bother you anymore. And then Jesus decides, uh, I, I suppose enough is enough. And he calls her name. Jesus calls her by name. Mary. It must be one of the most beautiful moments in all of Scripture. The risen Christ calls one of his dear ones to himself by her familiar name. She had turned her back on him when she had begun uh, having this conversation and asked this question. And so now she's looking back into the tomb. But when she hears her name, suddenly and at last, her eyes are opened. She knows exactly who this man is now. And so she turns and she looks and no doubt she cries out, Rabboni! And it's actually not just teacher, but it's my teacher. There's a, a note of intimacy here. My teacher, you're here. It's you. When he called her name, her eyes were opened. She was facing the wrong way, looking for the living among the dead in a dusty old tomb where Jesus was not. But at his call, she turns to him, and grief is replaced with gladness, and sorrow is replaced with celebration. And it's a very individual and personal call here. And that call comes for you and me as well. He calls her by name. Jesus said that's what he does. He does it for all of us, actually. John 10, verse 3. I am the good shepherd, and I call my sheep by name. Isaiah 43, verse 1. Fear not, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by name. You are mine. The call of Jesus Christ in the gospel, when it comes to us in the power of the Holy Spirit, it lifts the veil. veil. It, it, it dispels the darkness. It, it opens our eyes. Jesus' invitation to you is not some scattershot general proposition just thrown out at random. The fact that you are here this morning listening to this and hearing this right now, hearing the word of Christ, is profoundly personal. The risen Christ is now issuing to you the very same invitation that he issued to Mary. He's calling to you personally, individually, intimately. He's calling you to come and see who he is, to turn from the empty tomb. You've been looking in all the wrong places, perhaps looking for a very long time trying to find peace, trying to find pardon, trying to find a clean conscience. And you've been looking in all of the wrong places. You need to hear Christ calling you, calling you to himself. Look to him and your eyes will be opened and you will see the Lord and giver of life himself risen in victory over the grave. And nothing will ever be the same again. So Mary's confusion, and then Jesus' word of correction, and then his call. And he's calling to you too. He's calling to you in the gospel. Are you listening? Will you answer that call? Will you turn from the wrong direction in which you've been looking? and turn to Christ alone. He is the one. He is the only one that you need. And then finally, there's Jesus' word of commission. Look again at verses 17 and 18. Apparently, when she suddenly sees who he is, she does what I suspect most of us would do. She reaches out to take a hold of him, right? In her joy and in her wonder. But Jesus understands that, that behind this touch here, that there is more than simply just a, a touch of affection and of gratitude in Mary's heart. There's something else going on there in her heart. There is a, a desire there to, to hold on to him, right? 
to, to hold him down, so to speak. I'm never going to let you go. I'm never going to let you out of my sight again. Now that you're back, you're here to stay. And there's something of that going on in Mary's heart. And it's very understandable. She thought that she had lost him, and now here he is. And so she's clinging to him, sort of clutching to him, holding on to him possessively. She doesn't understand, you see, what must take place next. Jesus isn't here to stay. He must ascend to the right hand of the Father there to take his place as King of Kings and, and Lord of Lords, to pour out his Holy Spirit on the church so that the church might be, might be equipped to, to take his word to the ends of the earth, to all of the nations. And so he says to her, do not cling to me in verse 17, for I have not yet ascended to the Father. The issue isn't that he can't be touched. That's not the issue at all. You remember his words to Thomas when he appears to the disciples in the upper room. He says, hey, come on, Thomas. Come put your fingers in here. Come put your fingers where the nails were. Why don't you stick your hand right up here where that spear pierced my side if you doubt what's happened and who I am. He is physically risen. He rose in the same body which suffered. The issue is not physicality. The issue is he can't stay. And it's better for Mary, and it's better for the disciples, and it's better for us that he ascends. And that is Jesus' point. He wants, instead of Mary clinging to him, he says, no, Mary, I have a job for you. And he gives her a commission. He sends her back to the disciples with good news. Not just that Christ has risen, but why he has risen and what it is that his cross and empty tomb and soon ascendancy, what those things actually mean. Look at the message she is to proclaim. It's a beautiful but oddly phrased message. Why, why doesn't he just say to her, Mary, go back to my brothers and tell them that I'm ascending to my father. I mean, look at it. Look, look at verse 17. Jesus says, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, my God and your God. Why this particular emphasis on the fatherhood of God now? Well, simply because the great benefit, in fact, the greatest benefit of all that comes to us from the sufferings of Christ and, and comes to us through the exaltation of our Savior, the greatest thing in all of that is our adoption into the family of God. You are my brothers, Jesus says. You are my sisters. And my father is now your father. You've come to belong to the family because I died and rose and ascended to reign. And you are welcome in my family. Jesus lives that we might have a place in his family. That's really what Easter is all about. Normally, well, most years anyhow, not including this year, for most of us, Easter is about family, right? You travel to be with your family. You go to church with your family. You sit down and you eat a big meal with your family, right? You might go for an Easter egg hunt with your family. Easter, by tradition, for many of us, is about family. Please understand, it is about family, but it's about family in more ways than perhaps you might normally think. There is an invitation to you to come home. Come home to Jesus. Come home to himself. To turn to him in faith. The faith that opens eyes, that sees the Lord and trusts him. Trust him alone to be our rescuer and to be our king. That's the bigger family that you are welcomed into here at Easter. There is an invitation to trust Jesus. And when you do, you see, you become part of his family. John, John 1 uh, verse 13 says, To as many as received him, who believed in his name, he gave the right 
to be children of God. Children born not of blood, or of the, nor of the will of flesh, nor of the will of man, but born of God. And then in his first letter, John will also write, Behold what manner of love the Father has given us, that we should be called children of God. There is no privilege greater than the fact that wayward, hell-deserving sinners like me should be called a child of God, that I should be considered a co-heir with Christ, that I've been engrafted into the family of God. And that invitation is extended to you right now as Jesus calls to you by name. And he calls you to come to him. Jesus is saying to you, come home to your true family. You will become my brother. You will become my sister. My father will be your father, now and forever. May the Lord give all of us the grace to hear him calling to us. May the voice of King Jesus speaking our names, may we hear it. And may we turn from the empty tombs of this world to see him and to take our place in his family. Pray with me. Father God, we thank you for your great love. We thank you that you sent your son Jesus. God, we thank you that you had this plan to redeem us. That while we were yet sinners, before we knew we needed it, you had a plan in place to redeem us. God, we are humbled and amazed by that. That you would send your one and only Son into the world, not to condemn the world, no, but to free the world. And Lord God, that is the most amazing gift ever given. And God, on this day, you call us by name, each and every one of us, just as you called out to Mary. The question is, Lord, how will we respond? Lord, will we turn away from the empty tomb and seeking the things of this world and trying to find our satisfaction elsewhere? Will we put that behind us and turn towards you? Will we hear your calling on our lives? Will we put our faith in you? God, it's more than just believing that Jesus was. It's having faith in him and his promises. So on this day, Lord, that is my prayer, that all who are hearing my voice, wherever they might be, would hear your voice as well. They would know you are good. They would know you are God. They would know you want to be in relationship with them. And God, if maybe somebody's never done that before and they don't know how to do that, let's be abundantly clearer. We need to put our hope and trust in Jesus. We need to confess our sin and say, yes, I am a sinner in need of a Savior. I am broken. I have been broken. I have failed, fallen short of God's standard. And I keep messing up. I keep sinning. I keep failing. I'm the problem. I am not the solution. But in that moment, then, we can turn to Jesus, who is the solution. And if we put our hope and trust in him, if we believe in his promise, we too can inherit eternal life. If we put that sin behind us, if we turn away from it, if we turn to Jesus and say, Jesus, I want you to be my Lord and Savior. I want you to be the light of my life. I put my hope and trust in you for my eternal salvation. If we do that and we believe that, then we too can be part of the family of God. God, we thank you for that, each and every one of us who've had that. May we never take that for granted, Lord. And may we be continued to be encouraged to take that love into the world around us in whatever way, shape, or form you would allow us to do that. God, we thank you for Easter. We thank you for your love. We thank you for the cross. We thank you for your sacrifice. We thank you for all that you have done. We thank you for Jesus. It's in his name we pray. Amen. Well, again, thanks so much for worshiping with us this morning. If we here at Glory Baptist Church can serve you, if we can love you,
we can pray for you, if we can do something for you, let us know and we will do our best to do so. We want you to be blessed. We want you to know Jesus. That is what we are about. So go and uh, serve your king, wash your hands, and make much of Jesus wherever he sends you. Amen. Be blessed. Happy Easter.